Well, at long last I have completed it. After 50 hours in game, I have finished Rise of the Ronin, and I have a lot to say. After I released my initial impressions video, I already had a fair amount of opinions regarding the game. From things I was really enjoying, such as the character customization and open world, to things I was a bit more unsure about, like the story. I now have my full and complete thoughts to share regarding all of this and more. So much that I'm not entirely sure where to even start. So I guess we should just start at the beginning. What is Rise of the Ronin, and what does it try to do? Let's dive into it. But just know that in order to do this right, I will be covering spoilers. Also, I just want to mention, like I did in my initial impressions video, that yes, I did receive a review copy of this game from Sony and PlayStation. Still, I didn't try to race through the game in order to get a review out quickly, but instead I tried to take my time with it to experience it to the fullest. Now, Rise of the Ronin is the latest game from Team Ninja. These are the same developers behind Ninja Gaiden, but more recently the Neo series and Wolong. Rise of the Ronin, however, treads into new territory the Bakumatsu era, a time period which few games seek to cover, which is really quite a bummer. This is a turbulent time frame from 1853 to 1868, beginning with the United States forcing Japan to open its borders to trade with the West, and ending with the fall of the Tokugawa Shogunate with the rise of Imperial Japan. It is a period ripe with political intrigue and violence, culminating in the climactic Boshin War. What Rise of the Ronin seeks to do is place you right in the midst of these major events, introducing you to many significant figures, who all have unique ideas for what the future of Japan should look like. Yet, with this process being a difficult one, you will need to fight your way through all of the obstacles that lie in the way of a truly modern Japan. Your character is a member of a shadowy group of assassins who are staunchly anti-shogunate and had been carrying out missions in opposition to the government. After a shogunate raid killed the parents of you and your sibling, you were raised to be Blade Twins of the Veiled Edge, inseparable warriors whose primary goal is the destruction of the shogunate. However, on a major mission which sees you infiltrate US Commodore Matthew Perry's ship to retrieve a secret letter and assassinate Perry, you end up getting separated from your Blade Twin as you escape the disastrous encounter, and they do not. This sets you off on a quest to find them, but also a journey in which you will find yourself intertwined in the major events of the period after a chance encounter with the famous Sakamoto Ryoma. There is a lot to like about this game. To be honest, I think I enjoyed almost every aspect from it, apart from one which we'll get into. But I want to talk about the positives first, because there are many of them. Let us begin with the world. I love the world in Rise of the Ronin. We've never seen an open world game like this set in the Bakumatsu period. Sure, Like a Dragon Ishin is sort of an open world, but I want to save comparisons for later in the video. Now, originally, when the game first sets you loose into the area of Yokohama, I thought this was all that it was going to be. It's already pretty sizable, featuring both rural countryside and urban city streets. There were various regions to explore, each with their own fugitives to hunt down, enemy bases to destroy, and so many more things to see and find. I figured this was going to be it, and I was already alright with that. However, then I realized that, no, this is not it. This is just the beginning. The game is separated into three acts. Yokohama is only the setting for the first act. The second act takes you to Edo, with another massive map for you to explore. Then the third act takes you to Kyoto. And yes, you can always go back and explore previous areas, so you are never locked out of past content. This game is huge. Not only did I love exploring the world and experiencing all there was to do in each region, but I also love just sightseeing. It's awesome to go to places in Edo and Kyoto that I've actually visited in real life, but now get to see through the lens of the Bakumatsu period. However, I will say it is a bit strange that there is a Tenshu in Edo Castle, considering that the Tenshu actually burned down in the 1650s and was never rebuilt. But I'll let that slide. But really, I think it's this more realistic approach to Japan that is one of the driving factors behind my own love for it. It doesn't feel like a theme park of Japanese-esque sights to see, but instead feels like a more natural and real environment. It's just so incredibly varied, from run-down back alleys and slums to picturesque bridges and towns, from serene fields and forests to mighty castle walls. This is truly the best open-world Japan I have seen to date. 
Now, I know there have been some complaints about the graphics, with people saying that this game looks like a PS4 game on the PS5. And to be honest, I'm not entirely sure how to respond to that. This is really my first PS5 game, so I was not sure what to expect, but I wasn't expecting photorealism either. For what they are though, I think the graphics are fine. There was never anything that was overtly bad, and more often than not, I thought they were pretty good. But I am someone who enjoys playing a lot of older games though, so I'm not too picky when it comes to graphics as it is. The point is though, that the world is incredibly beautiful, and I could not stop exploring it. The game also gives you some interesting ways of getting around as well, with your grappling hook, glider, and horse. And while the horse controls are a bit janky, I was still happy to see all the customization you could do with your mount as well, from buying various horses of different levels to fitting them with unique armors. And as long as we're on the topic of customization, we might as well get a bit deeper into that, because this is also one of my favorite parts of the game. You get to customize so much about your character, and as I've already said, the character customizer is absolutely fantastic, allowing you to really create some awesome characters for both you and your twin. But it goes even further than that, with the game's incredible gear customization as well. Once you collect a piece of gear, you can go to your house and use the redesign option. From here, you can truly mix and match and decide how your outfit looks cosmetically. From Japanese clothing, to Western clothing, to military uniforms and armor. There are so many options to choose from and so much you have to collect. This even extends to all the weapons. All of these awesome styles of gear just really help to make exploring the world more enjoyable as well, because every time you find a chest or defeat a tough enemy, you have the chance to score some really awesome loot. However, you can also decorate your house, displaying and mounting weapons and art, and setting up a mannequin with gear you've acquired. And what is even more awesome is the fact that this game does something I don't think I've ever seen done before, in that how you decorate your house also impacts your gameplay from not only granting you certain bonuses while out exploring, but also determining which characters come to visit you at your house. There are also other side activities you can do in your house as well, such as sending out pilgrim dogs, loaning out cats you find in the open world, and gardening. And while most of these are just side activities that don't impact anything too much, having access to other characters can be nice. Interacting with characters you meet is a very important thing, as the stronger the bond you have with them, you will get access to unique story missions, as well as unique armor, weapons, and combat styles that can only be granted specifically from them. For example, I grinded out getting the highest bond with Jules Brunette so that I could get the awesome Cavaliers uniform. I really like this approach to building relationships with characters. Not only does strengthening your bond lead to more dialogue options and story content, but also gives you awesome rewards as well. I would say my favorite characters I bonded with were obviously Jules Brunette, but also Tokugawa Yoshinobu, Katsukaishu, and various members of the Shinsengumi. Of course I could have bonded more with the anti-shogunate faction as well, but I sort of just steered clear of them for this playthrough. Now, I think the last real positive thing I want to talk about is the combat, because yes, the combat is fantastic. Being difficult like the Neo or Dark Souls games, it obviously has a steep learning curve, and I imagine in some of the footage you can see on screen throughout this video, I might look pretty rough with it, but all in all, I definitely think I got the hang of it more and more as I progressed through the game. I love the variety here. Apart from the Neo series, I don't think there is another samurai game with such a high number of different weapons and fighting styles you can use. You have katana, odachi, naginata, yari, rifles with bayonets, European style great swords and sabers, along with Chinese swords. There is just so much to choose from, and that's not even counting secondary weapons, which include more rifles, pistols, bows, and shurikens. Each primary weapon though comes with a number of combat styles which can be learned and perfected, and what's cool is that most of these are all based off of real martial arts schools. Now, these styles work in sort of a rock, paper, scissors way. Each style counters another, so you will be constantly changing up your style as you take on different enemies. Some bosses even switch styles mid-fight, forcing you to do the same. There are certainly a number of similarities here you can draw from different games, but that did not stop the combat from overall feeling very fun and refreshing. I never dreaded a boss fight. In fact, I often came to look forward to them, because the challenge felt both enjoyable and rewarding. But while we are on this topic, what is the enemy variety even like in the game? Well, I'm happy to say that there is really nothing fantasy about the enemies in Rise of the Ronin. This was something that was really the focus of the Neo games, as you were constantly taking on angry yokai spirits, something which for me can be a bit of a turnoff in history-inspired games. But here it is much more grounded. All of your enemies are human. All of the bosses are human, aside from some wild boars, wolves, and dogs. 
Now, yes, some of the enemies do look bigger or more monstrous, but at the end of the day they are all just still human, and there is no magic to be seen whatsoever. Throughout the game you'll be facing down all sorts of foes, both pro-shogunate, anti-shogunate, westerners, and even simple bandits. You'll also be encountering fugitives, who are mini-bosses who reside throughout the regions on the map or within enemy bases. If you end up working with the Shogunate, the pro Shogun specific vendor will even give rewards for how many fugitives you have taken down. This is another part of the game that I ended up grinding out, so that I could receive unique outfits such as the Shogunate soldier hat and Shogunate officer uniform. Now all of these enemies have their own unique combat style that you will have to adjust to deal with. The same can be said for the actual main bosses who appear throughout the game's main story missions. However, for most of these you will also be accompanied by companions who will work with you to take some of the pressure off of you. For the most part though, it's up to you how you want to handle enemies, either by taking them out from range, sneaking up and taking them out silently, or through straight up battle. How you want to play is completely up to you and can be further perfected through your skill trees. You can also encounter other ronin wandering the world. These look like other player characters who are simply traveling throughout the map. They don't attack you unless you provoke them first. They mimic the same combat styles you would have, being that they too are ronins like yourself, so they can be particularly challenging. Additionally, you can also encounter other pilgrim dogs on the road as well. Small details like this just help to make the world feel more alive with activity. Now, the last thing I will mention about the combat is that the dismemberment is great. I know that some games like to shy away from this type of thing, and I understand why, but I'm glad that this game has some very satisfying physics for hacking through enemies almost like you are wielding a lightsaber. Now, there is certainly more I could get into regarding what I liked about the game, because when it comes down to it, I think I liked almost every aspect of the game. There was really only one major problem I had, and that was, yes, the story. Let's get into my one and only massive complaint I have about Rise of the Ronin. The story is not well put together, despite its very awesome connections to real history. I touched on this briefly in my initial impressions video, but I also made sure to mention that, being that I was not through the story yet at that point, I was hoping it would get better. Sadly, it does not. Throughout its entire duration, it is a jumbled mess of a quick-paced, forced narrative. Its setup is rushed, and most of, but not all of, the major characters you meet are shoved in your face, yet fail to make a lasting impression. Unless you do optional side missions with them to expand their story, something which could be either completely missed or outright ignored if you didn't already like the character. It's just overall a poorly told and poorly paced tragedy, but even then I don't think that's even the biggest sin. The worst part of the entire story, if not the entire game, is that it gives you the painful illusion of player choice and impact. Now, as I mentioned earlier from my brief synopsis, you are a blade twin of the Veiled Edge, out to find your other blade twin, only to also get wrapped up in the larger events of the Bakumatsu period and eventually the Boshin War. And I will say, the idea of the story is really quite good. I love the concept of it, a lone ronin out to find his sibling during the midst of the Bakumatsu period. And it's awesome to see all the historical attention to detail, as you interact with various real historical figures and take an active role in a number of real historical events, even if, yes, your character and the shadowy group of assassins you hail from is indeed fictional. Now, originally, the Veiled Edge is all about killing the Shogun and ending the Shogunate, and that is still the mission that your Blade Twin is on as well. However, they are much more evil in their intent. All along your journey, you keep running into your Blade Twin, who is now chaotic and seemingly trying to destroy Japan for some unspoken reason. So you have to keep fighting them to thwart their efforts. Every time you defeat them, letting them simply get up and limp away, something which becomes a frustrating trope in the game. As for you, however, you are not as dark as your twin, and instead, you are more focused on saving Japan, and that is the mindset you should really approach the game with. Saving Japan. I wish I knew this before starting the game. This is the mindset you need to have. Don't walk into the game thinking that you're going to be fighting either for or against the Shogunate because you really can't, despite the fact that the game straight up tells us we can and gives us factional specific missions. This all comes together to feel rather clunky if you are just playing the game from the angle of trying to support one side. I obviously tried to support the Shogunate for my first playthrough. Big surprise, I know. 
So most of my time was spent trying to find ways to help the Shogunate and build up my bonds with pro-Shogunate characters. This also meant I was ignoring most of the anti-Shogunate characters because I was of the mindset that for this playthrough I did not want to take their side. This becomes a massive issue because it's really only through this optional side content of playing through each individual character's side story that we actually come to learn more about them and come to care for them. However, because I purposefully didn't do that for any of the anti-Shogunate characters, I never bonded with them or came to like them. So when the game forced me to continually work with them, it just kept making things increasingly frustrating. And this is where you will likely improve your experience immensely if you don't go in with the mindset of helping one side over the other, and just try to learn about and experience both sides. This is because the main character we go through everything with is Sakamoto Ryoma, someone who is trying to save Japan by bringing everyone together. Thus, the game sort of tries to weave its way through the events of real history and lets you only make a couple of alternate history decisions, which in the grand scheme of things don't end up really impacting the story at all. It was a definite letdown, because I was initially hopeful that I could rewrite history, and help reform the shogunate, and win the Boshin War for the shogun and move toward democracy, but no. Which is a bummer, because the game very clearly sets itself up and gives us the idea that we'll be able to make big choices and will have an impact with what we decide to do. But unfortunately, that's just not the case. Therefore, you'll be forced to play missions from the shogunate faction and the anti-shogunate faction, even if you don't want to. You have to. You are forced to. And it creates some incredibly silly and tedious situations. For instance, I ended up joining the Shinsengumi by the third act of the game, and raided the anti-shogunate supporters. However, then Ryoma shows up and says we have to save them, and forces me to go back and fight through all of my Shinsengumi allies just to save the lives of the same people I just fought against. Then later, the anti-shogunate side has me infiltrate the Shinsengumi, despite the fact that I already made the decision to join them earlier. I feel like they made us play both sides of the conflict just for the sake of adding more content, yet I would be far more satisfied with a shorter game if it made more sense. Because the game is riddled with this sort of back and forth nature, fighting the people you just worked alongside. The game clearly has its own story to tell, and any decision you make does not matter. You are forced into constantly doing what you don't want to do. Another example is if you want to support the Shogunate, you also get forced into helping the formation of the Sacho Alliance of Satsuma and Choshu. I didn't want to do that, I'm trying to help the Shogunate, not help the Shogunate's enemies. But you are not allowed to say no, and so often you are given stupid dialogue options where you have to choose between two different ways of just saying yes. You can't refuse. It makes player choice seem like a facade. And it gets more insulting when you are given choices during big historical moments. The first time I saw this was during the assassination of Inosuke, which, by the way, it is awesome that you even get to take part in this event. But you are given the option of if you want to spare him or not. And I did, thinking it would drastically alter the story for me and also help the Shogunate. However, no, it doesn't, and he still gets killed by your blade twin shortly after, so it really didn't matter at all. But that's not even the worst moment. The biggest gut punch for me is if you take the Shogunate's side at the Battle of Toba Fushimi. Throughout the story, you get to work alongside Katsu Kaishu to do all these things to strengthen the Shogunate, modernizing their army by forming the Denchutai through the help of the French, and later working alongside the Shinsengumi to root out resistance in Kyoto. And it all comes together at Toba Fushimi, as you fight alongside Jules Brunette and Kondo Isami, as the Denchutai and Shinsengumi come together to smash their way through the Imperial forces. For me, this was perhaps the most epic moment in the game because it felt like you were actually turning the tide of history by leading the Shogunate to victory, even defeating Saigo Takamori and Katsura Kogoro. But it doesn't matter, because your blade twin then ruins things by trying to assassinate the shogun, forcing him to flee, thereby causing the shogunate side to lose the battle you just essentially won. It hurts. Now, I imagine the story might feel better, or at least make a bit more sense if you side against the shogunate. But even still, there is a large portion of the game that does force you to help the shogunate anyway. So this means that if you go into the game thinking that you are going to be staunchly anti-shogunate, you will still end up working with them and helping them get stronger throughout the majority of the second act. So even then, you couldn't strictly play things in an anti-shogunate fashion either. It's like, imagine you are playing Fallout New Vegas, and although you really like Caesar's Legion, and can work with them and help them throughout the game, by the end, you are still forced into working with the NCR to win the Battle of Hoover Dam. You really don't have a choice. The game has its own story to tell. And this would not be a problem if we were not a silent protagonist. 
If our character actually spoke and had a real personality, and we didn't have dialogue options, I think this would all be fine, because then we could hear what our character wants. We know what they are after and are not forced into making choices that ultimately don't matter. But the simple fact that we can create our own character, and that we can decide what we say and what actions we take throughout the story, completely makes everything so frustrating. Because by the end, what we want for our character doesn't mean anything. And I don't think this would be nearly as massive a problem, and a painful one at that, if it were not for the fact that I think the rest of the game is absolutely spectacular. If the rest of the game was also bad, I would be able to just easily write the story off as just another problem. But with the rest of the game being so good, the fact that the story fails is really just heartbreaking. Now, there is this thing called the Testament of the Soul. This allows you to go back and visit past places and replay past missions, and through this you can see what things would be like if you had taken the other path. They want you to think that there is a branching story here. But really, there is not, and you can see how two separate options will still lead to the same result, just perhaps shown from a different angle. But even with all of this said, despite my anger and frustration with the story, I still could not put the game down. In fact, even as I'm writing this, and I know as I'm going to be recording this, I've already began planning out my next playthrough, which will of course be from the anti-Shogunate side. How will I design my character? What weapons will I use? Who will I forge my bonds with? All these awesome things to consider, because this game does have good replay value. And a bit of that might also come from the fact that it incorporates a number of similar concepts from other recent Samurai games. I touched on this a bit as well in my initial impressions video, but I obviously want to return to it more thoroughly here. The reason why I wanted to save any comparison talk for its own section is because I did not want to constantly be dropping comparisons in throughout the whole video, but would rather save it for here. And remember, anything I say here in this comparison section is just my own opinion. I am not the final authority on what is good or bad. I'm just here to share my own thoughts. We are all allowed to have our own opinions. Now, Rise of the Ronin stands on its own two legs, and although we don't have to compare it to any other game if we don't want to, it still finds itself within the interesting catalog of samurai games, and especially recent samurai games. One game that I have seen continually mentioned both in the comments section of my initial impressions video and also in many other places across the internet is that of Ghost of Tsushima. People keep comparing this game to Ghost of Tsushima, and in most cases, people are saying that Ghost of Tsushima is the better game, despite the fact that at the end of the day, they are both completely different styles of game. The one area they do overlap is in regards to their open world, in which, yes, Rise of the Ronin did take plenty of inspiration from Ghost of Tsushima, yet which game does the world better? In my opinion, I think Rise of the Ronin easily has the better world. Not only is it bigger and more varied, but it is also just way more fun to explore. This is through finding vastly more interesting loot, taking on enemies with much more variety, and meeting way more real historical figures to interact and bond with. Not to mention the way it looks, too. As I mentioned in my initial impressions video, and also sort of alluded to earlier in this video, I like the look of the world here way more in Rise of the Ronin. Like I previously stated, Rise of the Ronin feels more real, while Ghost of Tsushima, while undeniably beautiful, does feel like a theme park of what you would see on postcards from Japan. And yes, I have played Ghost of Tsushima recently, because when I picked up my PS5 for the purpose of playing Rise of the Ronin, I also picked up Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut. And I have to say, and I know many of you won't like hearing this, but I don't think Ghost of Tsushima holds up that well. Especially if we are entertaining the comparisons to Rise of the Ronin. Rise of the Ronin's world is richer than Ghost of Tsushima, its combat is far more engaging than Ghost of Tsushima, and its customization is leagues ahead of Ghost of Tsushima. The one place where I do think Ghost of Tsushima outshines Rise of the Ronin is obviously in its story. I still very much enjoy the more focused and polished story in Ghost of Tsushima, despite its historical inaccuracies. Now. Another game we can draw comparisons to, but perhaps not as many, is that of Like a Dragon Ishin. Like a Dragon Ishin is of course also set in the Bakumatsu period, and also centers around the figure of Sakamoto Ryoma. However, in Ishin, we are just set within the bustling streets of Kyoto. Ishin has, I think, one of the greatest stories of any samurai game I have ever played. It's not one that leans into any stupid tropes, but instead deals far more with concepts like brotherhood and justice, along with incredibly interesting internal drama within the Shinsengumi, 
with plenty of fascinating revelations and twists, all between great references to real history. Sure, the game itself can be wacky and cartoony at times, but the actual story of Ishin is definitely better than the one in both Rise of the Ronin and Ghost of Tsushima. Yet once again, I think the wide open world, combat system, and customization of Rise of the Ronin easily surpass that of Ishin. The last game comparison I want to make, and perhaps the most heartwarming I've seen, are the comparisons people have made between Rise of the Ronin and the Way of the Samurai series. These are the most fair comparisons I've seen, because yes, I agree, Rise of the Ronin feels like what Way of the Samurai 5 would have been. For those of you who are unaware, the Way of the Samurai series, which is also frequently set in the Edo period, is another great series which allows players to create their own character, another silent protagonist, and embark on an epic story with tons of branching paths. My favorite game in the series is by far Way of the Samurai 3, which is set during the Sengoku Jidai. It's a game I reviewed on the channel years ago, but is still one of my favorite samurai games to date, largely through its many possible endings and awesome combat system. Way of the Samurai 4 was also set in the Bakumatsu period, but I've never really been able to get into it yet, no matter how many times I've tried. A bit of this might be because the PC port of the game on Steam is pretty clunky. Either way, Rise of the Ronin does feel like a natural evolution for what the series could have been had it continued, so I do love all the comparisons made there. I wholeheartedly agree. Now, if we could only get a real Way of the Samurai 5, that would be amazing. But anyways, those are all the comparisons I want to make right now. Sure, I could get into the difficulty comparisons between Rise of the Ronin and games like Neo, Sekiro, and Dark Souls, but being that out of all of those I've only really ever played a bit of Neo, I don't think I have the experience to really talk on that front just yet. Alright, so with all of that said, what rating would I give Rise of the Ronin? As I've discussed thoroughly throughout this video, I feel it's a game that has done so much right only to fall short due to its story. What rating would I actually give it? I've been going back and forth on this for quite a bit, and originally I was thinking of giving the game just a 7 out of 10, but that really didn't sit right with me. I had a ton of fun with this game, and I can firmly say that despite the story being a mess, that it is still a great samurai game all said and done so I have to give it at least the proper credit it deserves, and bump it up to an 8 out of 10. Which, I know I've been giving a lot of 8 out of 10s on game reviews lately, but that's just the way it is. But still, I put 50 hours into this game so far, and of those 50 hours, I enjoyed every minute of it, and I'm already planning replays. Had the story just been better, and this game could easily move up into the 9 out of 10 range, if not even 10 out of 10. Like I said though, it's just sad that the story is really the one and only thing holding this game back because everything else within it is seriously good, and does what it does better than other recent samurai games. The ending does leave room for further DLC, and hints at things like the Battle of Hakodate. I just hope that if they do make more DLC, they also go back to the main story, to not only improve how it's told, but also to actually give players more choice. I think I would like that a bit more than continuing on to finishing the Boshin War and perhaps even the Satsuma Rebellion. If they just did that, I think that it would quickly solve this game's only problem, immediately bumping it up. So I am eager to see what comes next for Rise of the Ronin. But with that said, have you played the game yet? If so, what do you think about it? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most interesting.